Every new Houdini release, of course, also needs some new simulation tools. In this case, this year, we haven't got anything groundbreaking and new, but a lot of nice and small improvements or nice and small new tools to play with. So let's take a rapid fire look at all of them. I want to start out with the new Wind Shadow node or the new Wind Shadow workflow. And for this, I'm going to use these two little demo setups that you can also find in the scene files. First of all, let's start with this one. This is just a simple grid. We set some pinpoints, a pinpoints group for a vellum simulation, and then use this inside a copy node to get quite a few of them. Let's drop down a vellum configure cloth node, where this in. Let's set a pin group here, and let's also bring in a collision geometry, which in my case will be just a box. Let's ghost a box, let's bring up our handles tool, and let's move one side of the box back so that it blocks a few of those ribbons here. Let's wire this into the collision geometry and let's drop down a vellum solver. For our inputs in, let's go to the forces tab, let's add some wind, maybe a value of minus five in the C direction, so blowing from this direction to this direction. And if we hit play now, we should see the result that we should be used to from previous vellum releases. All our ribbons here are affected by this wind. Now let's turn on wind shadowing, let's move it from none to ray, and if we hit play now, now those ribbons that are hidden behind this box right here, our collision object, are not affected by the wind as much. We also got some different options here that you can tweak, however I found the defaults work quite well in most cases. This wind shadow option is not something that is only available on the realm solver. This is also just a standard pop node. For this, let's turn both of these back off. Let's jump into a realm solver and let's in here drop down a pop wind to create a wind. Again, blowing in the negative Z direction and then a pop wind shadow. Write this into the force output. And again, if we hit play, we should see the same result. And since these are generic pop forces, this also works, for example, on rigid bodies and probably also particles and so on. Another option for the pop wind shadow is self shadowing. For this, I created this little demo right here. Again, a grid, again, some pinpoints, and again, a copy swap. Again, this goes into a vellum cloth. Again, we set up our pinpoints. And again, we use a vellum solver where our inputs in. Go to a forces tab. Let's again add a wind forest in here as well. Let's add wind shadowing as well. And if we hit play now, we should see not too much of a change with our geometry. What we need to do to enable self shadowing is expand these options here and enable self shadow. And now if we hit play, we can see that the first few grids are affected a lot more by the wind than the last few grids in here. These are blocked by the grids before them. The ever popular Vellum Rest Blend node has got a new feature as well and a quite handy feature, especially for motion design, which allows us to use a mask attribute to control the rest blend. Let's quickly test this. I have this little demo scene here. I'm setting out with a box, I'm remeshing it, and this will be my main geometry and then I have this altered version of it simply by normalizing the p-vector I've turned it into a sphere and this will be my other object. Let's set this quickly up, let's drop down again a vellum cloth and let's turn our geometry here into a very stiff cloth, set the band stiffness to a value of 1 and then this goes into a vellum solver. By all of this in we need a ground position, let's create one and let's move it down a value of minus 1.1 units. And now let's jump inside and drop down a vellum rest blend. To set this up, we want to base our source, our rest blend source on a SOP. And for this, let's select our B geometry. This is our sphere. We want to evaluate this each frame. And if we now hit play, our box should morph instantly into a sphere like this. This is the behavior as usual. What's new with Houdini 20 is that we can set this morphing with an attribute, a mask attribute. Let's quickly set this up. Let's use, for example, here on our B geometry, let's use a mask by feature node like this. Let's visualize our mask attribute. 
And I first of all want to remap the combined mask, make the contrast a lot stronger. And I want to animate this angle parameter here. Let's start off with a very small angle like this on frame 1. And then on frame 48, let's move it up until 90 degrees like this. And now in our Vellum Solver, this should already grab the mask attribute that we created. And if I play our simulation now, over time, over the first 48 frames, we should see a rest plant happening here driven by a mask attribute. So quite easy and fast to set up compared to the previous methods. Finally, to finish our Vellum section, we got a nice and small update to the Vellum brush. For this again, I'm using a small test tube. This has a circle that I reversed and remeshed and then also turned into a vellum cloth. And this goes into the vellum brush. Let's write this in. Let's also create a ground position here as well. Let's move this down a tiny bit, minus 0 0.01. And now let's take a look at the new feature. And the new feature works with the pins that we can set inside the vellum brush node. So to create pins, we can hit shift and drag with our middle mouse button to create some pins right here. And in the previous Houdini version, all we could do with pins is grab them with a middle mouse and move them about. This is already quite handy, but what's, for example, still quite difficult is to fold, for example, a circle here in half. For this, now with Houdini 20, we got actual handles. So we can hit K and also L to bring up this handle right here. And now we can simply use this handle to fold our geometry down the middle like this. This is all I have to say about Vellum. Let's take a quick look at Pyro. For this, I want to use a Pyro configure billowy smoke just as a test object. And all I want to show here is a new option in the Pyro solver under the buoyancy. Let's take a look at the default behavior. If you play on a timeline, we can see our Pyro soak mainly rising up and this is the behavior that you're all used to. Let's go to the shape tab and let's expand the buoyancy. And what we now have with Houdini 20 is a density influence gravity, where very dense areas tend to fall down instead of rise up. And this makes for a much more realistic simulation if you're, for example, simulating a dust cloud. Let's play this again. And instead of most of this rising up, we got a lot of areas from a smoke here that are falling down as well. Again, making a simulation much more realistic. That's all I have for Pyro. Let's finally take a look at RBDs. First of all, there's some new options on the RBD material fracture node. For this, again, I want to bring in a test geo, simply a tube with some wall thickness applied, and I want to wire this into an RBD material fracture. And the thing that's new here is that the material type of glass now also works with non-planar glass objects. So for example, with the old workflow that only works for flat panes, this will deform our cylinder and make this tool quite unusable. But now with Houdini 20, we can set this to curved glass and now this works as we expect. And finally, we also have the option to set up sticky collisions. For this, let's build a simple test scene. Let's drop down a box. On this box, I want to set the size to 2 by 0 0.06 by 2. And let's move it up a value of 0.03 like this to make it sit on the ground plane. Next, let's shatter this plane using again an RBD material fracture. And on the primary fracture, I want to get rid of one fracturing level and I want to set the scatter points to 60. And also let's set the fog volume noise type to none like this to get a very uniform scattering. This is the first object. Let's now also create a sticky object. This will be a sphere. The sphere I want to set to polygons. Also want to move it back three units and up 0.5 units like this. And I want to leave the uniform scale here at one. Let's also turn this into an RBD object using an RBD configure node. And on that RBD configure node, I want to enable that new option. I want to enable sticky collisions. And I want to mainly work with the min sticky collision impulse slider right here. If this is set to minus one, we got no sticky collisions. If you set this to zero, we get sticky collisions on every hit. And if we set it to something larger, this will be based on the force that the object hits the upper object. So let's set this to zero. Finally, we need some velocity. So let's use an attrib 
adjust vector for this. In here, I want to enable preprocess. I want to override the initial value and I want to override this with a constant value. And that constant value will be minus five on the x-axis and 2.5 on the y-axis. This is all we need. Let's finally drop down a merge node. Let's fire both in and let's use an RVD bullet solver and finally see what we get here. And if we hit play, well, everything falls down. We need a ground plane. Let's quickly create this under collisions here. Let's select a ground plane as a ground type. And now if we hit play, yep, we got this Katamari look right here where our sphere is collecting these little pieces that I created with my RBD material fracture. This is all I have to tell you for simulations for Dini 20. And finally, now let's move on to Karma and Solaris. And if you like us and want to support us or just want to learn more about Houdini and end of courses, consider becoming a patron of ours. And to everyone already supporting us, thank you so much. Without you, Antagma in this form would not be possible. With a special thank you going out to Mohamed Alabri, Momomiya Ichigo, Joseph Howerton and David Aiden. Thank you so much, guys.